Presence, the podcast for everyone interested in bodywork, embodiment, and somatic practices. I'm Andrew Rosenstock, your host and guide on this enlightening journey. With my expertise as a somatic movement therapist, yoga therapist, and certified rolfer, I'll merge clinical insight with real-world experience to enrich our discussions with our guests. Through engaging and informative talks, this podcast delves into mind-body paradigms, offering insights and strategies to empower personal growth. Your support is vital for our grassroots and lo-fi production. If you connect with our content, please leave a positive review and subscribe on your preferred platform. Your engagement helps us reach a broader audience and supports our mission. So thanks for tuning in today to Touching Into Presence. Fasten your seatbelt as we embark on a journey to explore the transformative power of contemplative and somatic practices together. It was a pleasure to be in conversation today with Pedro Prado. Pedro has been instructing Rolfing SI for over 30 years. He's a member of the advanced and movement faculties of the Dr. Ida Rolf Institute, as well as a somatic experiencing instructor for the Somatic Experiencing Trauma Institute. He's a clinical psychologist and a former professor of somatic psychology. His signature approach to the work, to which he has devoted his clinical practice and research, explores the bridges among the structural, functional, and psychobiological perspectives. Since having become a rolfer in 1981, Pedro has introduced rolfing and nurtured practitioner communities in his native Brazil and elsewhere in the world. He has taught throughout the U.S., Latin America, Europe, Japan, South Africa, and Australia. In today's talk, we speak about Pedro's history and how he came to rolfing, how rolfing came to Brazil, his experiences and work in the academic and clinical world, the importance of collective inquiry, exploring new concepts and teaching strategies, the importance of philosophy and science, the field of embodiment, and much more. This was another one of those talks that just flew by and it felt like we just barely scratched the surface. Hopefully we'll be in more conversations together, as Pedro is a beautiful soul with a wealth of information and lived experiences. Hi, Pedro. So with that, so nice enough to meet of this you. intro, and <laughs> nice let's to begin you. our talk. It's really about uh, <laughs> about being in conversation to what, you know, what is, in our case, we can talk about rolfing and structural integration, um, but what what is what are these practices about, and, you know, what, what got people into them, and what makes them passionate about them? That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a collective inquiry. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not something that we do by ourselves. Mm-hmm. We are all into the same game. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to to share what we have been in, you know, up and around. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, see how can we exchange, inspire, you know, mm-hmm. and see the the avenues that we have been playing with. Because I'm sure that Others are having also the same sort of personal inquiry, and that that's all very interesting, you know. So yeah, yeah. And for me, one of the things that's very exciting is we haven't had any of the. You're the first Brazil person to come on, or the first person from the you know the Brazil rolfing ERA or the ABR 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 in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're the first one to come on, which is exciting. Uh, I've taken a class with uh, Lucia, uh, and I originally wanted to do my phase three in Brazil so that I could have the Rolf movement incorporated into it. But it, uh, for logistical reasons, it didn't happen. But I'm excited as you're talking about, like, you know, we're in this and sharing and, and I think having the the different uh, communities that are pointing towards a similar thing, but I think it's going to be, I'm really excited to have you on for that reason, because we, as I said, we haven't had anyone from Brazil yet. Uh, yeah, I'd like to have yeah. more on. Yeah, that's good. There are a couple topics, you know, you mentioned one that I had forgotten, you know, <laughs> which is the whole Brazilian adventure, you know, that's that's been big, you know. Uh, also the communitarian development of an educational model. Mm-hmm. You know the the elements involved in a holistic practice. Mm-hmm. You know how is it that we can uh, walk our talk? You know in terms of mm-hmm. learning, teaching, and performing a holistic art. You know yeah. uh, with all the different assessments and the different uh, layers of the being. So multi-dimensional work. You know. Mm-hmm. 
So that's one thing that I like to emphasize and talk about it. The other point is, though, how is it that personally, uh, from my own path, you know, mm-hmm. I have the psychobiological perspective, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like the corner that I have been personally uh, inquiring and developing. Mm-hmm. And I think there is some to say on that. Yeah. The other point that I have done, you know, is my connection with the academic world, you know, the you know, my PhD thesis and uh, uh, what it represents in terms of, you know, one step more, you know, mm-hmm. in the education of academic beings. You know, I'm now in the board of the Ida Rolf Foundation, Research Foundation. You know, so it's another piece that I think uh, can we can talk about. For sure. For sure. Yeah, what else? Well, the, the virtual library, I think it's another... Oh, yeah. Another big, big topic, you know, that if people could use it, I think this could benefit a lot. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I remember actually at one point when the library library was down, being oh, like, dear. no, <laughs> no, because it was so, especially when I was, uh, when I was just, just beginning, that was... It was so helpful uh, to look up articles, to find information. And it's actually yeah. one of the, it's one of the um, reasons, uh, one of the things I've gotten from feedback from from this podcast is a similar thing about, I've had some of older Rolfers or, you know, people who've been practicing since the 70s and hearing their stories and having it in an archival way that people can come back and listen to has been, uh, you know, it's really nice. Yeah. So I'd love, I'd, I'd love to go into that. When when I started my my podcast, the there was, I made a list of people who I really was excited to 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 talk with to share, and your name was on the list uh, very very early on. And luckily, through a colleague, I think it was Marcella, I think is who connected us. Marcella, uh, yeah. I was very excited because I was excited to have you on, and partly because I. I I have moved much more into the psychobiological realm and, and, you know, as, as you know, our community is mixed on it, but having, having you as one of the, I would say senior people in that, um, helping to lead that, that way forward is, um, is one of the things I want to talk about. I would say probably the best way to start. And I joke with that because clearly we've already started. Maybe we, we do talk a bit about what, what, how did Pedro <laughs> come into this, this field, this avenue. What what was it that brought you to uh, where you are now? And hearing some of sure. that. Sure. Well, it's all all connected, you know. Ex- exactly. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and I'm sure we'll go in these various ways that. And we. Like, yeah. There's yeah. another point. I don't know if you know that I, I also ventured into the SE world. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and I am an advanced instructor from that uh, school as well. Mm-hmm. So that bridge, you know, between SC and Rolfi, you know, mm-hmm. is is another topic of interest, you know. Yeah. Same, same. And we've had a few people on who are uh, Rolfers or other SI people and SE or straight alone SE. And it's actually something that we, we'll see if we get into it today. I have, I'm not an SE person, but I practice in very similar ways and share my sort of reasons as to why and why not. But I, yeah, I'd love to go more to that because you know yeah. the name of the the name of the podcast is touching into presence, and I I'd say that that se se as I understand it, when a practitioner really understands it or or lives it, is all about touching into the presence of the felt experience. Yeah. So yeah, let's weave and wag and and see see where we go. I actually love the the free form conversations. That's a lot how my practice is when I'm with clients. I I try to have as much space as possible for instead of dictating this is how it needs to go to sort of say okay well let's see let's have a loose structure and see what is it that arises and and try to keep it not too chaotic but not too strict either yeah yeah so yeah what is it that either yeah how did you get in you know how did you get involved in i I don't even like i guess maybe we'll even keep it more broad than just rolfing although i'd be curious how that happened but how did you get into the the greater body work or uh, somatic work or yeah. phenomenological yeah. work <laughs> as a whole. Yeah, these are good. These are good. Good questions. You know, 
Well, I think this is a good start. You know, yeah. tell a little bit about my my initial profession. You know, I was a, a clinical psychologist, and soon, you know, in my career, I, I had a a double a double entryway. Like I was in the academic world, you know, in the, soon after I graduated, and also, you know, in the clinical realm. You know, and as a clinical psychologist, you know, there was this connection between, you know, Jung and Reich, you know, and how is it that Reich uh, brought the unconscious to the concrete physical uh, perception, you know, that would give uh, us something very palpable to work with. So that first holistic uh, reasoning, you know, in terms of, yes, you know, the defenses, yes, the possibilities of expression are all into the flesh, you know, and you can access, you can read, you can interfere on that organization, you know. So the connection between, you know, muscle fibers, proprioception, self-image, body schema, they were already an identity, you know, they were present in the get-go, you know, of my training. Had a wonderful master in Brazil called Gaiarsa, you know, he was a pioneer of studying, you know, the effects of the different muscle uh, character, muscle character, muscle contractions, you know, the different body types into, into one's life you know so the the changing of the character armor here armor and this possibility you know of the person uh, reshaping its own affective connection uh, with with himself you know was very uh, a revelation for me so i started to to play you know with early gadgets you know like tuning boards and balancing chords that would give us more flexibility and more possibilities of breaking up the rigidity of the body, you know. Remembering that this is early 70s, you know, it's when, you know, the still a lot of exploration was being done, you know, and a lot of repression was being liberated in the general culture. So we were all about, you know, opening up the body, opening up the possibilities that we had. And reshaping the body was a very important piece, you know, but not simply because of its shape, but rather, you know, because of the adaptability, because of the flexibility, because of the conditions that the person could have to experiment and to express themselves. So my approach, you know, to to the clinical work all, was always connected, you know, the body and the experience of the body, you know, in the psychological dimension. You know. So that came to you know the right time, the right information at the right age. You know, it was in my early 30s, I think. And that was when Rolfing came, the news about Rolfing reached Brazil. And uh, Gaiarsa brought a rover, Jim Riscos, to Brazil, who did the first group, you know, the first batch, you know, like, and I was one of them. And immediately, you know, my first experience was of such a freedom, you know, and I used to play tennis and my arms would make, you know, like snaps and that I could really uh, reach and feel freer in the movement. And also more sure about myself. There was something that was very important in my personal experience then, you know. And, you know, it was the right time. I wanted to do some studies, you know, I wanted to go to the first world, you know, and see what's happening in, you know, in, the, in the nest of the new techniques and SLN and all of that. So Rolfing seemed to be a very appropriate Thing for me to to pursue because it was you know like say compact, short and had that appeal you know of transforming the structure, and through the physical assessing and transforming unconsciously even the whole uh, emotional experience of the person you know, so it was for me like the 
the exploring and living this holistic paradigm. You know, like it was easy to talk about the holistic paradigm, but do you really change the person when you change the body? You know, can the person change its own shape and form? You know, uh, how much can this last? What are the effects of that into the human experience? So those questions came up right away. And they, because of the, let's say, structural concrete nature, you know, of the premise of Rolfing, you know, it was very appealing to me because I felt, okay, if these principles are correct, this is a major technique that I can uh, appreciate. So I went to Boulder, you know, and did my first part, first part of my training there. Then at those times I was... Uh, by myself, you know, in Brazil, Sammy Frank, you know, the one that wrote the organ of shape with Varela, you know, so he was, he had relatives in Brazil. So he came here and we met and we became friends and we started to exchange sessions. You know, when I graduated, he helped me, set me up in Boulder. And that was a very, very pleasurable ex ex experience. You know, it was... So it was nice, you know, to expand and to get this principle. And then I understood, you know, that, okay, it's not only about the emotions. It's not only about the body. It's about the whole being. It's about transformation. And it's very clearly organized around the line. It's very clearly organizing the structure and the connection between structure and uh, function, you know, and behavior were present in that principle. So I was, okay, here I came, rolled up my sleeves, you know, and came back to Brazil. And I knew, you know, this is not a single man's uh, game. You know, either you have a community or what, you know. So very, it was very natural, you know, that sensation, that uh, assuming that role to bring uh, and have Rolfing available for my uh, Brazilian colleagues, you know. So working, and then it was the whole thing, Andrew. You know, it was about uh, promoting rolfing, and everything was new in Brazil. They had a uh, curiosity. So TV shows, interviews, congresses, conferences, uh, would, uh, any open art opening that I would go to, there would be the same conversation, you know, explaining what is this about, getting people motivated. Soon my practice went on very well, you know, and I continued, you know, and went back to the States, did my advanced training and so on, until like there were then clients that became rolfers. And together we started to to build a, an association in Brazil of the rolfers that were with the same mission, you know. I entered the the path of becoming an instructor. You know, it took me a couple of years, but it was very profitable. And I would come and go. You know, come to the states, back to Brazil, back to the states. At this point, Louis Schutz, you know, was an instructor uh, in New York City, and he invited me to substitute him in his practice as he was assisting Stacy Mills in Florida. And I took care of his clients and of his cats. <laughs> and at that time, you know, I supported myself, you know, by coming to the U.S., working some in New York City, and then back to Brazil. And I kept that practice on as my apprenticeship uh, went on, you know. But this was also, and you're participating in the structuring of the Roth Institute itself, you know, so everything was emerging at that time. So the curriculum was not set. The division between structure and movement was very polemic, you know. And the uh, uh, appearance of craniosacral techniques, you know, and the osteopathic uh, unfolding of the that aspect of rolfing, you know. So all of those openings were hard to integrate, you know, as faculty then kind of holding on to those, to the basic values and participating in the, the polemic differences between those, all the groups that had different passions about, you know, but I didn't uh, went any 
further from those concepts that I had when I started on, you know, which was that holistic perspective, you know, that yes, we are touching the whole being when we when we work. It's not about a technique, it's about a transformational process. You know, that was my take from the get-go. And so the movement work, you know, was the aspect of the work that carried, you know, in itself the the values of the subjective, you know, the values of the emotions, you know, and I knew that this is the process is the person, you know, how is that person tra transferring? A joint serves a certain kind of movement of a certain intention of a person, you know, and if we don't get there, you know, we are going to lose, you know, like so many people that they do great, great, beautiful work that lasts two weeks, you know, that the person cannot hold on, cannot maintain, they don't own the work, you know. So that challenge of how can you really be with the person, with what they can, with what they want, with what they need, with how they assimilate that is a clinical piece, you know, of the work, but that's what makes it real, you know. Uh, otherwise, it's just a theoretical premise you know, and not really something that serves people. You know? So the movement work was there, you know, and in the beginning of my training in Brazil already, you know, all I was doing was about, you know, stimulating different muscle fibers and you know, having people track their experience as they would release their character armors, you know. And I continued to do that with the movement work even though I loved the touch work and manipulation and the notions of structure, you know, which is the basic ground of our work, I appreciated so much, you know, the, the movement work as well. So there I went on, you know, and became a movement instructor, you know, for the Institute. And I had a vision, you know, that uh, it's hard to teach those things separately. You know, you teach one piece here, another chunk there, another third chunk there. So the challenge of a holistic uh, practice, if you learn it chunk by chunk, is how do you integrate those pieces? It's not about my preference. It's about having a wide, broad vision that encompasses those human aspects. You know? To me, it almost sounds like a disintegrated approach to an integrated process, right? You know, definitely. Yeah, definitely. yeah, yeah. And that was very, let's say, easy, you know, to to have this in Brazil. Somehow it's a land of movement. It's more uh, into the soul of our folks, you know, that more open-minded uh, stance. So immediately, you know, then Leo King, who is Heather Star Song's daughter, I know, and at that time, Tom Zwing, uh, stepdaughter, you know. So she was young at this point. She assisted me the first class I taught in Brazil. And together we said, well, let's use the auditing phase, which is the way the training was happening those days, that you had the practitioners where the work was being delivered to clients and you had auditors, which is now equivalent to our unit two. But let's have the auditors learn from a different perspective, you know. I had started, you know, like in studying, rolfing. Uh, I used to stretch, you know, and kind of try to find the locations as I would stretch. Me and Dorothy Hunter, you know, in Central Park, used to play with stretches and find the the, the ideas of structures in our own bodies, you know. So that ended, uh, led to was built a little system, you know, which is still available for all, you know, but it's a translation of raw thing into stretches, you know, it's, now it's all fashionable, you know, fashion stretches, you know, but this was <laughs> talking about 30 years ago, you know, that piece was there already. And I used that in the first class I assisted Emmett Hutchings in Boulder, and Tio Lu Chao was one of the auditors then, and we used to use the structure stretches for people to understand the recipe, to understand in an embodied way. And then when I met Lael here in Brazil, and she had more concepts about movement 
because of her heritage. We put this together, you know, and we used it for teaching the auditors. So we were teaching Rolfing from two avenues at the same time. You know, the, the, the beginning, the technical recipe, and, you know, the recipe through movement. So that pioneer uh, event, you know, ended up uh, seeding a model of education. Let's say, how can we teach structure and function together? You know, it doesn't have to be separated. How is it that you include those elements? And so that's what originated what we call later the Brazilian Educational Project, which is a dual certification. Lots of problems, you know, it was not easy because you had a training that had to be longer. You had a training that had to have instructors that were cross-trained. They had to be not only cross-trained, but they had to be instructors of both modalities. Because at the same time, Andrew, the movement work and the structure work were evolving. You know, they were, the principles came up, you know, the, this made, you know, the movement work get some shape. And so it was not just, you know, rotations or few techniques to enhance uh, and to pattern another way of, uh, of the structure, you know, to make the structure more sensitive to, to the brainstem. It was about, you know, a system that you can non-formulistically uh, choose how to intervene and how to access the client. Mm. So those two dimensions, you know, were developing. And the, the model of teaching was also developing. You know, so we were creating another model that, that was happening. And all of that, we had to deal with the politics of the Institute. You know, we had to go yeah. with the Institute. It right. was not about, you know, going separately. Right. So my my vision was we need to be together. This is a collective inquiry. And we need not to stop creativity, imposing your ideas into one another, rather respecting and integrating. So it was now that I tell you here, I uh, get very touched because I see mm -hmm. what a beautiful collective endeavor that we are mm -hmm. all engaged in, you know, and how much has already happened mm. oh my god you asked me a small question and no, I it's, for, it's, for half well, an hour. <laughs> yeah but that's that, that's part of it and there, there's so much there's so much history in this and there's also so much history there are certain what i will sometimes call gatekeepers right just about time and place i mean not just time and place but a lot of it about time and place and yeah. you happen to be in, in both of those and then as we're hearing like your passion and, and your driving force pushing forward is then also giving more depth and more information to it. So it's one of the, the hard parts is I remember in my, uh, I think phase three, uh, a teacher had commented, uh, actually it was a, a teacher of a different, a person who was in a different phase that said, you know, less is always more in terms of the, in terms of when you're working on someone and while I agree that less can be more, actually, once you start to get into something and you unpack it, there's a there's a wealth of information in there. And so, you know, sometimes sometimes a, a simple question actually leads into a lot more, which is I, which I think is important both in terms of this context, but also in, in terms of of the work. As I'm sure your SE background would say, you know, you you're with a client and they're they're giving quick answers, and you just somehow you you, you know you can sense there's more, and you you pop a little question or you pop an inquiry in for them. And, you know, I had a client actually that we ended up going over an hour and a half on the other night because it was finally her getting to a place to actually open up and expand and to have that. And, and so, you know, it's, for me, it's all beautiful. It's all really just yeah, beautiful. Isn't it? Yeah. We are very privileged mm -hmm. to have landed our airplane in this, <laughs> in this, in this territory, you know, I think it's yeah. a, such a beautiful methodology, such a, a wise inspiration, you know, that mm -hmm. either Rolf had and yeah. that we are carrying on. Yeah, yeah. I love to hear actually too, and, and I don't know this we might weave in at another point, but when you did mention movement in Brazil, you know, I I got very fortunate that 
Um, I spent 12 years traveling all over the world, working all over the world. And, and a part of that unexpectedly taught me about culture and how culture defines a lot of how we move through the world, how we see the world, how we embody in the world. And Brazilians, like no matter, almost wherever you go, they're, they're movers. And it's really interesting to look at the culture, especially you look at the surrounding countries around you, not that they're not movers, but the, the different previous, I'm sure has to do with the, the conquistadors that were there previously yeah. and how they are, you know, their way of being. You could, I think mo most people wouldn't necessarily be able to tell a Brazilian versus an Argentinian and most, like, let's say most Americans, but most South Americans would just by how they walk, just by how that they move. Yeah. I think that's, you know, really interesting. And I think it's learning more about, you know, how, I got there's so many there's so many avenues I want to sort of go down through that about part of that, but also the you know there's something that you when you were mentioning community that what I'm hearing from you and it is something I almost find the opposite in the u s and it sounds different in, in Europe as well that in my experience there a lot of the rolfers are together in a way, but also we don't like there's such a maverickness of my way is the way and I can do it. And there's such a splintered group. I mean, that's through the history of the Rolf Institute or the various names we've splintered and splintered. And there still is community of, of, for sure. But as I'm hearing it from you, that the, the resilience sound like the, the community comes to, you guys seem to foster more together in that sort of way. Yeah. I don't know your experience of that. It's a tricky area. We might not want to <laughs> go down that no. way too. Well, Andrew, uh, best of community, you know, of course, I think we are all evolving as well, mm. you know, so there is a lot of, uh, let's say, elements and edges that all of us have, you know, so it's not so simple to find safety, you know, mm. in oneself as you relate to differences, you know. Mm. So how can you accept, you know, the individuality and communality, you know? And, and I think this is an exercise. And I think that as we go uh, in terms of offering also, we always have that central reference, which is, you know, the balanced structure in gravity, that the key to that, you know. And that principle, you know, unfolds itself not only in my body but also in the society I built you mm -hmm. know and we are part of the building of that society <laughs> you know it's mm -hmm. not that we we have the answer we are oh, yeah. build, building it and if you notice you know for instance in terms of these different taxonomies that we talk about which at one point they were opposed because people could not see each other you know could not respect each other and then the humble exercise of hanging on, you know, of promoting without simply quitting and uh, creating another school or things like that, mm. ended up, you know, allowing us to perceive the value of several approaches. And I think Jeff Maitland, you know, with his uh, brilliant mind, mm. you know, he was one who was able to articulate what was kind of dispersed in our premises in a very simple way. You know, we have several layers of experience. We have several taxonomies, and these are ways to access the person. Any of them are valid, you know. So they are just different aspects of the being and different, therefore, require different tools. But into any one of them that you use, you're affecting the whole. Mm. So the principle of holism, you know, which is our meta principle, you know, enc encompasses those ideas. And he articulated it very clearly and ended up being a one single chart. You know, mm. And this definitely helped people to be more patient with each other and more inclusive and perceive the richness of the other perspectives. You know, so I'm more because other rolfers are studying other things, mm -hmm, you know, because, sure. you know, Hubert Godard is part of our, our community. Yeah. Yeah. I am more because the role rolfing is bigger, because Jen and Michael and Patsy, blah, 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 are developing other corners, and Ray and mm -hmm. 
hero oh. and you know mm-hmm. other colleagues you know and because robert went into the fashion world mm-hmm. so this is all adding to i think the minute that we the we lose the connection to the gravity, the body in gravity, you know, then we we are lost. You know, well, I think, we yeah. Lose the sense, yeah. Yeah, I think you hit a good point, which I don't hear very often, is uh, it's really about, it is about all of that, whereas uh, whereas some, and, 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 and I probably fall into this sometimes too, so you're actually helping me be better at this too, we'll go to, no, it's it's like, you know, it's this, and it's not, this it's partly this but it's also this it's also this it's also (laughs) all of that but we you know we can as humans get really uh uh, dualistic very and and we go into it is just the you know the fascia that's all the fascia and then and it's you know for me it's it's like no it's it's not all that but i then i'm in the past uh uh, up until this moment thanks to you i will get stuck more into that and have to remember yes that is but it is a part of it and there's so much more. And, and so it is lovely that, you know, one of the things I actually really did love about my training and I would share this with people is that a typical massage training, people would come in uh, a lot of most people going to many people going to massage. We kind of start without a previous professional practice, but a lot of people coming into Rolvers and to Rolfing, and they come from from being a psychiatrist, from being a construction worker, from they come from being all these different yeah. avenues. Yeah. And then when we're in the classroom, we're bridging together different ways of being in the world, and that's that's really it's a, yeah. it's a lovely thing. Uh, yeah. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, of course, you know, we bump into the egos and into the vanity and into mm-hmm. jealousy. So these are human feelings, you know, it's part of each of us, our evolution to deal with them mm-hmm. and not bother the other ones yeah. <laughs> with, who, with who we are. You know? Yeah, I'll say for my own, my own experience, <laughs> my own experience is I believe it to be Rolf movement, especially tonic function, starting to understand more of uh Hubert's work and then I, I actually see tonic function function blending in really perfectly with SE. I see that there's this really beautiful uh interrelay between them. Uh, that uh, that has been very helpful for me to become a better rolfer by I still clearly have my ego and identity, but it's it's brought in a deeper layer of feeling inquiry or inquiry of feeling and, and that that does allow me to catch myself sometimes days later still um, but sometimes moments later of wait a minute this this is an old pattern this is an old response can you feel that can you and then how can i move around that yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i think what uh, attention was because when you talk about the emotional dimension you know mm-hmm. and when we go into the somatic aspects of emotion you mm-hmm. know and when we have to connect the somatic elements of emotions, which is always a subjective aspect also, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and this connecting with the structure of the body, you know, I think that multi-dimensional aspect, the challenge is dealing with emotions from a Rolfing perspective, Mm -hmm. you know, which is very different than different uh, schools that, talk about emotions. So go to bioenergetics, go to many psychoanalysis and many other, uh, let's say, psychological uh, therapies and premises. So it's different when you do one Rolfing sessions and you do one bioenergetics session. You know, this was the way people explored that in the early years. You know, you would have two different sets of work so that the person could kind of build a whole while now, you know, we are paying more attention to the role of the autonomics, you know, mm-hmm. in 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 one's shape, you know, and the role of autonomics in survival, the mm-hmm. role of autonomics into building defenses, the role of autonomics into uh, organizing my adaptability and orientation in life. Mm-hmm. So here you are, you know, have your orientation, but you also have a system that is organizing your orientation. 
And this is building your pre-movement. This is mm -hmm. building how you move. Right. And that pre-movement is based on your structure. You know, if mm -hmm. you don't have a, a structure that allows your pre-movement, that allows you to to adapt to survival. Right. So I think that understanding now, you know, is the SE helped a lot. Mm -hmm. Not because it created something absolutely new, but we are being able to use those premises in our work as assessment tools, mm -hmm. you know. So, and now with the latest researches on fascia, you know, in which we talk about the autonomics all distributed along the fascia and the fascia being a whole that is functioning much faster than any muscle action, you know, mm -hmm. into to organize movement and into stabilizing structure. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a direct connection which is also described it in very somatic physical ways, which are also our main reference as mm -hmm. rolfers. So I think this ha ha, you know, that came at least for me, you know, simultaneously as I was studying SC and autonomics, like adding to my understanding of this multi-dimensional being. You know, it was also the scientific world was also bringing in researches that talked about, you know, the role of the autonomics in the fascia, the fascia movement, you know, mm -hmm. the fascia structure. So I think it's a very interesting moment where the psychobiological uh, taxonomy receives a an assessment that is somatic and that mm -hmm. is concrete and that you can. Of course, this adds another clinical challenge to the practitioner mm -hmm. because you have to be able to track the shifts of the autonomics as you are working, you know, mm -hmm. and have the client, you know, own that mm -hmm. as you are working. So yeah. the art of Rolfi in terms of uh, tracking the processes of the client with the client, exploring the subjective nature of the patterns Mm -hmm. Many times, you know, it's mm -hmm. in the meaning. Sometimes the meaning of a pattern is holding all the structure. Mm -hmm. And if you are, you can go into the meaning and the connection of the meaning with survival and autonomics, mm -hmm. and then you can definitely anchor in gravity. You know, mm -hmm. and this will give the person more safety in their bodies, shifting their identity, more flow with their own emotional realms. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so you do, yeah. <laughs> Just one more sentence, if I may. Yeah, please, please, please. 20 more yeah. sentences, please. <laughs> yeah, no. Which is uh, the it's the the subjective aspect of the work, you know, which is how do I build and live my patterns, you know? What are the filters that I have? What was beautiful for me at the beginning was that no matter what, you know, just organizing the body in gravity will take care of a lot of the emotion of the mm -hmm. person. Of course, you know, it brings more safety. It brings more balance. It brings more presence. So the person can be more present and therefore orient itself differently. So even though we didn't have all those movement theories in terms of ground and space, in terms of orientation, even though we didn't have those assessment tools in the psychobiological perspective, you know, through the, the, the movement of the sympathetic and parasympathetic dynamics, it happened you know, it was at the beginning, you just had the line and you had the recipe and it happened. Mm -hmm. Why? It happened unconsciously, you know, but it happened. You know, there was shift. The shape changed, the emotional life changed, the presence in the world changed. So that yeah. was very interesting. And the premise of body-mind oneness mm -hmm. was there. But yeah. now we can unfold all of those elements and explain and therefore define clearer assessment tools and also do a way better job because we have consciousness with that. Mm -hmm. Again, I need to quote Jeff Maitland, you know, when he talks about the pre-reflexive to the reflexive layers, you know, from unconsciousness to languaging, to being present with your own mind, you know. So this makes a big difference. And this is well rooted in our original premise. It's just an evolution that we are being able to add to our field. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I see it a bit like I think Dr. Rolf really under she fig, started figuring things out, but she didn't have a language for it because it was so new and new is usually yeah. not a language for newness. Uh, and so yeah. she saw she felt this thing, but it was it was different. Yeah. It was new. The paradigm was shifting for her, but paradigms are very difficult to shift for other people. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then as more people, as, as it was practiced, more and more awareness, more came up, more inquiry came in. And, and then the whole field continues to grow, you know, and in the words of Foucault, it was somewhat of an epistemic shift or has become an epistemic shift of yeah. this, which is, which is what's always, uh, always yeah. happening. Um, yeah. yeah. It's important, Andrew, that because we are like, uh, we say, <laughs> there's a saying in Portuguese, I don't know if it works in English, which is the fish will never say I'm wet. Because it's yeah, really, yeah. In, in that environment, you know. Right. And so we are living in this shift of epistemological shift, mm -hmm. you know. But this is part of our existence. You know, we see it and then we lose the perspective and then we see it again and then we lose mm -hmm. the perspective. I find that the value that Ida had was to anchor that in a very simple couple of premises. You know, mm -hmm. she, she she was fluid in her language, you know, mm -hmm. but she emphasized and re-emphasized the value of structure and the value of the connective tissue to organize the structure mm -hmm. and the value of gravity. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, connective tissue is everywhere. You know, people mm -hmm. are talking about it. Yeah. They don't fully understand, you know, the 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 importance of of gravity and our relationship with gravity, you know. But here we are, still holding yeah. on a, a flag that was uh, and, and shepherding a, the growth of a seed that was planted, you know, in the fifties. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think they don't also understand the role of the nervous system in relation to fascia. I think that's something that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, coming out more it's and more and more. It's coming, and I think yeah. we are part. We are part of that. You know, yeah. I'm sure we'll, we'll add to that inquiry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you. I think you might appreciate this, this sort of story that will tie in. Where I had a new client last week, who uh, it turns out is a, a couples therapist. I didn't know that when I started with him, and I. Uh, but he was very. His body was very aware to me. I could kind of sense that. But I was on one side of his body, even just looking, and I would say I felt his nervous system watching me and so i went to the other side of his body and again it kind of felt to me like okay you know his safe what i would say is his sub his autonomics were saying how where is my safety how am i safe all that and i just kind of asked him hey what are you you know what are you noticing here and he said it's funny it kind of seems like my body is tracking you and i said yeah that that's pretty much what it seems like to me too and and once we had that shift, he was able to actually sink into the table more, which is affecting his structure to gravity. He was not resisting gravity as much because, because and I say this to a lot of my clients, I'll pick something up. I'll say, you notice if I let this go, it goes down. But we have this, you know, we have all of these subconscious patterns that we don't even recognize, all these pre-movements and these pre-reflectives that we don't even recognize. And until we, until we can shift that, then there's, you know, there's a lot of that that's in the way, but once we become just a little bit of awareness, it doesn't necessarily change it entirely, but it all, it opens up a new door for that person to start to become aware of some of those pre movements. So those, those prior, uh, what, what, you know, protective mechanisms. And it's, and as a, in my practice, that's been one of the most amazing shifts is how to, yeah sense into that and then provide a way to allow people to not have me tell them, hey, this is what's going on, but to have them start to explore into it so that they uh, can yeah. claim the agency and autonomy of that. Yeah. And, and yeah. 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 It puts in a style and it puts in a a vision of the work and the, and the scope of the work as well, mm. you know. So the big challenge is how to to teach that and mm. to yeah yeah. No, no, I'm hoping you can share because I I, I mean I think you are yeah. one of the people who can. I, I don't know how to do that yet. Yeah, well, you're doing it as you just described it. The 
that session you know, that you're mm-hmm. talking about, you know, that process. Uh, so what I find can be very useful is that we open up that conversation with the mm-hmm. whole community, you know. Yeah, which is partly why we're here today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are not alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have we have a little time and there's a lot of still other topics. I'm curious if there's any, you know, and maybe if if I'm lucky, I'll say we'll be able to have another call because I'm I mean personally I'm 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 loving this. I'm hanging onto my iPad with every every fiber of my fascia. I have to keep actually remembering that I keep getting pulled in and I have to keep finding my back body to allow myself to to be here because it is so exciting. But is there, you know, with the, the time, because we only have a little time before your next meeting, is there anything of the initial topics that you want to touch a little bit into? Or is there do you want to keep going with any of these? Where is where's you know, where's Pedro right now in in his space. Yeah, yeah there is one topic, you know, yeah. just, I think which is the definition of Rofi, you know, mm. it, it comes. <laughs> Do saying, we have enough time? You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, talks about, you know, the philosophy, mm-hmm. talks about the science and talks about the art, you know, and we give a lot of attention, you know, like the premise of the, of the philosophy in terms of this holistic, multidimensional work, you know, this whole perspective, you know, a philosophical attitude, you know, which is a phenomenological, experiential, subjective, process-oriented work, you know. We talk a lot about the art of Rolfing also, you know, how do you do it? How do you touch where do you touch? How long do you touch? Or shall we, how do you use language? Blah, blah, blah. You know, so this movement assessments, psychobiological assessments now, more that energetic assessments, you know, that you have to make it more clear and open as well. But this is all about the art of roffing. But very little is talked about the science of roffing. You know, it's a, it's a part that we do not develop as much, you know. At least we don't talk about. And the same way that we used to have other, uh, let's say, to talk about movement, you would talk about kinesiology models, which were outside of Rolfing. To talk about emotions, you would talk about different uh, psychotherapy schools. You know, in terms of science, I think it's the same thing, you know that people use models of science that are not really appropriate for the kind of investment that we, uh, investigations that we are making, you know. So what I have to say, you know, that I think that we need collectively to be able to bring up what is happening, the magic that happens in your study studios, you know, so in your practices, in your offices, because it's with the description, with finding language, even though we're going to be stumbled, stumbling around, we don't have the right language, but we will develop one to talk about uh, uh, the nature of what is it that we do so that we can polish it out, turn this into more predict- predictable or uh, tools, you know, and we can share collectively and explore in a more organized way, you know. So I find, you know, that uh, bringing case studies up, you know, is a, is a premise. You know. It's an important piece. Uh, we could put this into the curriculums of the of the school, but it's not fully embraced yet. You know, uh, now I, I'm being part of the board of the Idenrolf Research Foundation. You know, and I think this is we are putting a lot of energy into education of science to the members, to the practitioners, you know, to the students. Uh, personally, you know, I like I, if you remember, I mentioned that I was an academic person at the beginning of my career, so I stayed in the university for twelve years, you know. 
And that's when I did my master's paper that was about contributions of either theoretical contributions of either Rolf's thinking to those that work with posture in psychology. You know, that was that uh, reflection, you know. But then later on, you know, uh, we in Brazil developed the social clinic in Sao Paulo, basically. And that clinic was, you know, so it came out of the need of serving people with lower income possibilities, mm -hmm. you know. And also out of the pleasure that the students had to work together in a classroom, you know, mm -hmm. and how fun it was, you know, to see each other's processes and exchange on that level, you know. So a group of rofers in Sao Paulo just decided, why don't we get together, you know, and we work with people lovely. Yeah. in our, you know, we work together like a classroom set. And I was an instructor and I could, so, and I could supervise them. And so we could make this be, let's say, a social work. At the same time, an educational piece, you know, and also a building of a research uh, attitude. So we started to build questionnaires, you know, because we need some something more uniform. We needed something that would be the same for everybody, you know, so that we could build research. So what is important that we ask our clients? How do we investigate their their goals? How do we uh, what do we need to know about their best? What's an intake form? What's the perspective of the rover? Blah blah blah. I can talk hours on that, you know. But it was a beautiful piece, you know. And now the process continues, and we have a data bank with two thousand clients already that were seen. And all those results are tabled, you know, and you have statistics on on our performance, you know. So there was a moment, you know, in which uh, I dove into and used that data bank to produce my what became my PhD thesis, which was, you know, the presence of the psychobiological perspective in Rolfing, you know. How is it that Rolfing per se is a psychobiological perspective? It's not that I can uh, I can make af afirma assert that, but you know I could. The piece I did was how can those forms you know bring to light that perspective? Does that exist or not? And so it was very interesting to see, you know, from the reports of the client, reports of the rolfers, the both qualitative and quantitative, you know, uh, pieces reviewed, you know, psychobiological dimension of rolfing present there in rolfing, you know. So this led us to bring uh, rolfing as a post graduation program in an emergent university. You know, there was a university in Sao Paulo that decided to encompass the alternative uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. So they said, oh, good, let's let's have Rolfing as well. So we could get a degree, you know, Rolfers could join the program. Mm -hmm. They would study more scientific methodology. And I was coordinating the program, you know. So we ended up, you know, with over 50 case studies uh, done. Unfortunately, they are still in Portuguese. You know, only the abstracts are in English. But we are working on that, making this more available. But it was bringing the empirical evidences in a simple case studies, you know, with uh, some mistakes in methodology sometimes, you know, but with honest attempts to, to bring to light and to society, you know, what is Rolfing doing? So that was a beautiful piece that you have, I think, a second round now with the Ida Rolf Foundation that is putting so much uh, energy uh, into the case studies. You know, So they are going to have a better level and they are going to, have to bridge this into the education in the schools, the different schools. Then maybe, you know, with Eric Jacobson and Libby Eason that are there, Robert Schleip is also there. You know, and Kevin McCoy is there, and Johannes Freiburg is there. So there's 
a group of people that is fostering. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's the, also the European lady, you know. Uh, Wait, Katja, I think that's doing her PhD. Kat, Katja, Katja yeah. is also coming in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is, I'll, I'll say for me, I'm, uh, there's, there's both an excitement to that, but also there's something in me that says there's almost no, like the science of it is, is not it. Uh, it's the, the, and that's what I like about, I think, tonic function, although there's science, it's more, it's the philosophy. And I think, I, I, so I'm, I'm not, I'm struggling a little bit because for me, I'm just, I have a different view and I'm not saying that the science isn't important, but there's a part of me that says, how could we ever measure a unique person's, you know, or a person's unique experience that the, it's the phenomenological um, that is, was, is, is, is somewhat the measurable part is, is something. Yeah, well, you're touching, you're, you're touching the very point, you know, yeah. what kind of, what kind of science are we thinking, mm -hmm. you know? That science, you know, the experimental science, the one that measures the, the millimeters and that wants reproduction, mm -hmm. uh, that breaks up the phenomenological aspect of it, of the experience, mm -hmm. is serves for some aspects of Rolfi, but doesn't mm -hmm. serve for all aspects of Rolfi, you know. Mm -hmm. So we need to expand the vision of science in Rolfi. Mm -hmm. And I think, okay. you know, yeah. Jeff, Jeff did something beautiful in his, uh, and also uh, John Cottingham also mm -hmm. described it case studies where there was a mixture of qualitative and quantitative elements present with the same value, you know. So the discussion needs to happen. That's what I want to say, you know, and I think we have to find how is it that that individual experience, you know, uh, becomes a collective experience or yeah. what aspects of a collective experience the individual experience has, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I hope, I hope that as you're doing that, we also bring in more of the neuroscience because I see that being a real important part of the, as the, the human shapes that the, you know, their, their neurology changes both in, both in terms of the, the nerves, but also their a, a subjective view of the world shifts yeah. measuring that. Yeah. Um, That'd be really great. So, so to the point about science, not mm. defining the truth, mm. is exploring the phenomena. Mm. So science is, is not about saying what's the truth. You know, it's more about you know, describing and changing in its well, own we, definition. Yeah. It's shift, shifting. Now we discovered that, so everything changes. So, you know, now we discover another element. We're always I changing. Think, I think it can be. I I live in Boston, and I like to joke that everything in Boston is either brains or crystals. Like it's the extreme end because there's so many universities, and here the science is is so it's very it's become very ego, and this is my way, and it's like this has to be what it is. But it, you're, yeah. you're right. You're right. It, it, that I, I agree with you that that's. That's to me not what science really is. Science is about how can we keep going further to prove the next thing, to prove the next thing, to prove. Yeah. 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 No, the, the whole structure of the discussions in, in any paper mm. goes like that. I, because of that, I found that mm. and I propose to study that. Mm. <laughs> you know? So that's the flow, you know, and then the new studies may reinforce or may bring new lights into. So if science doesn't have is not open to change, it loses its purpose. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a and dynamic. Then, uh, yeah. and there, there is. I think that that change. I mean, the the American in me, which is different than the Brazilian in you, it says when there starts to be you know so much of the science here is all behind behind businesses and and money, and that all that that starts to change oh. change what it is. And that's the environment, unfortunately. That that many of my clients, uh, many of my clients are Harvard. Uh, work for Harvard or work for Big Pharma, and they're they're science based people, but they're it's 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 such a different than what you're talking about, and, and yeah. what you're talking yeah. about is, is I think the real science, the the, the yeah. that inquiry and whatnot, and the I'm pure speaking, spirit, you know, yeah, is not and I'm lab, speaking in broad, not lab driven, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm speaking in broad stereotypes. This, of course, is not 100. percent It's just um, yeah, what you're speaking about. I, I agree with. Yeah. I get behind that. Um, that's, a, that's a big discussion. You know, it is. Gonna, <laughs> that. 
It is, but I, I, um, I know, I know you have to get off soon, and I have to get ready for some clients. I, I, um, I, I hope that this is the first of of another and or, or many. I, I've really enjoyed listening to you, learning from you, being in conversation, yeah. sharing space. You, you have also one of those things that I, that um, that some that, that the, the people who I really enjoy talking to, which is it's not just how you talk, but the space you fill up. So people listening will hear but not be able to see just the the way you do hold your line, the way you do create space, the way your nervous system invites me in to, to be in dialogue instead of just this is, you know, this is what I know. And so I'm I'm just grateful for that. I think that shows the sign of a of of a uh, a seasoned and embodied practitioner. And it's it's what I am not yet at, but aiming to be more more towards. Uh, <laughs> more towards. So yeah, I'm just, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this. Do you want, is there, if people have, I mean, we'll, we'll put a link to your library, which we didn't get a chance to talk to, but I should talk about, but we'll, we can, I can put a link to that up there. Are there other things you want people, if they wanted to find out more information about you, any other, any other things you want to share? Or? Uh, you know, I, I'm not one of those people that, <laughs> I work a lot, Andrew, but I'm not one of those people that made a web page or yeah. that uh, go play in the social media. You know, I don't, have, I don't have Facebook. I don't look at Instagram. I don't, any of that, you know. You're, you're so, better off. You're much better off. <laughs> you know, well, you know, nowadays it's a language, you know. Sometimes I think uh, I miss, I should somehow, you know, uh, build up, but I'm not there. But one thing that I'd like to uh, just to, uh, to put the message out is that as a result of my my thesis, you know, mm-hmm. I had to assemble the whole available Rolfing literature that was very dispersed in the world. You know, not even the Rolf Institute had the full collection of the magazines that it edited, you know. Bulletins was all lost around the world. So one part of the the thesis was, well, I need to make a literature review. You know what what's available. You know, so I searched it and I rebuilt the collections. You know, the the collections, and then you know with some uh, input from the some instructor of the Roth Institute said, why why don't we scan those articles? You know, because we used to teach from articles. Mm-hmm. They were yeah, still we still. Would, Still, yeah. right? during my training, I still got lots of older articles. Yeah, so you give articles. So why don't we scan those articles and make them available online for those people? And that was the origin of the the virtual library, the Ida, Ida P. Rolf mm-hmm. uh, Library for Structure Integration, you know, and IPRlibrary.com or PedroPrado.com.br, you know, mm-hmm. which is a uh, the Roth Institute put some money, you know, but then it extrapolated, <laughs> I went way further mm-hmm. on that line. I found some supporters and now we need money to continue. But the point is that there is a, a library that carries, you know, all those main main publications, you know, mm-hmm. bulletin, Roth lines, structure integration, structure function and integration, the notes, Hans Fleury's notes is there. The Yazi yearbooks are there. So that, uh, and plus, you know, many academic papers that have been published. You know, there are many theses of many people mm-hmm. that can be found there. Mm-hmm. So I, if you want to study more, you know, and this is a resource. It's mm-hmm. free. You know, we'll find ways to support it, but uh, everybody can easily Access it under those as those addresses that I just mentioned. Yeah, well, you know, I'll gladly share that. I know that as you mentioned yeah. before, I, it was something that I found really helpful, especially when I was first starting. And it's something I, I, I still I have. Um, I think the Rolf uh, Rolf website has old article, old journals up to I think two thousand three. I forget the exact year. And I downloaded every one of them and I just started to slowly when I have time go through the old articles because yeah. there's, there's so much information. Um, yeah. and, and there was something you, 
you did say that I, I think uh, we do have to go, but uh, about the the very beginning about the old, you know, you sort of saying, oh, you know, we're the, the old guys. And I was thinking that the the old and the new really always need to have conversations. You need to say, okay, well, what, what has been, what is going, what can we learn from the past? What can we learn? Yeah. From the yeah, yeah. And it's amazing to see, you know, the old timers are there, of course, but you have lots of new authors, mm-hmm. lots in the last magazine that came out, just came out. Mm-hmm. You have uh, almost 10 new authors, you know, that you had to build new, new spaces for them, you know, in the library. And that shows how alive we are. You know, we are still very alive. And that's a place that we have to to nourish and to nourish ourselves from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope you put, I have one article from two. I've got a few articles. I hope you, I'm excited to see my name in the uh in the library as well. Uh, so that's yeah. that's exciting. I'll have more coming. But yeah, I'll let you go and um we'll we'll reconnect to hopefully have another call because we've we've just broached so much, but it's it's really been a pleasure. It's an honor. I know people will get a lot from this. So yeah. thank thank you for your time yeah. and for your yeah. history and you. Yeah, so here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See you some other time this year. Yeah. Have a good day, Prater. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to us at Touching Into Presence. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. You can find out more about Pedro at pedroprada.com.br. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast and subscribe to it through the platform of your choice. When you do this, it really helps other people find us, and we greatly appreciate your support. We look forward to hearing back from you and seeing you on our next conversation at Touching Into Presence. Bye for now.